Hello and good afternoon. I'm Greg Niemeyer and I'm thrilled to welcome you to another episode of our lecture series on visual cultures today. Our speaker today is Jason Lazarus, who's joining us from Tampa, Florida, and uh, we're very excited to have him here. Before we get started, um, I want to point out that our sponsors, the Berkeley Arts and Design uh, Program, as well as the uh, Letters and Sciences Division at Berkeley, um, are, are generous supporters, and we're really glad to be um, receiving their support to be able to make this lecture series and this new content develop. It's not every semester that we're able to develop a new course, although we should, but in this semester it feels particularly compelling to make new courses, new contents, new ways of teaching, because the world is changing so much. So thank you for your support, l and and Arts and Design in, uh, to make that happen. The curriculum is in fact evolving. So um, I'm going to introduce Jason Lazarus in a little bit. Uh, he's going to talk about his public, public address today. And uh, before I do that, I'm going to uh, mention that if you are uh, joining us uh, from Zoom, uh, you can always uh, add your questions and uh, in the questions and answer box. We also have the chat open where we'd like you to see your comments and responses um, as we go along and um, our amazing grad students and graduate st student instructors, Edgar, uh, Fabian Frias and Hala Kadura are going to monitor the chat and the Q&A and uh, they will present your questions. If your questions get, get called out and you're still in, uh, in, in person present, then we can give you audio signals so you can speak directly and we can hear your beautiful voice. So we'd love to do that if you're still around and uh, that'll be at the end of the presentation uh, by Jason Lazarus. Now let me introduce Jason. Uh, he's a, an artist and an assistant professor for art and art history at the University of South Florida. And uh, he is actually uh, joining us today as he is moving from one house to another and uh, moving into his uh, new house is very exciting. And so that's gonna happen tomorrow. So maybe we'll see some boxes in the background or um, some other surprises we don't know yet, but um, we really appreciate him joining us in this moment of beginnings and endings in this transitional moment in this pivotal moment of his life. Jason Lazarus is an artist exploring vision and visibility. His work includes a range of fluid methodologies, original found and appropriated images, text as image, animated GIFs, photo derived sculptures made collaboratively with the public, pigment inks as image, live archives, LED light images and public submission repositories, among others. The archive certainly is a wonderful format for making art. And I also uh, really remember um, Jason's paintings on photographs with photographic, the, uh, on photographic paper with photo, photochemical agents, and uh, he will talk about those as well. This expanded photographic practice seeks new approaches of inquiry, embodiment, and bearing witness through both individual and collective research and image production. As I said, he currently is assistant professor of art and art history at the University of South Florida, where there's a wonderful grad program, if any of you are interested in checking that out. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jason Lazarus. And here normally, Jason, you would hear lots of applause, but it's just uh, online, so it's more visual. So I'm going to stop here and we're going to switch the spotlight over to you. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, very sensitive to this being such a strange and weird time for everyone. Uh, and at the same time, I know that you are all embarking on a career arc where biographies and experiences are so varied and what is success is a kind of perennial very personal question. Um, so I also want to encourage you to um, really, really um, question actively. I think we have a, a question and answer period at the end here. Um, yes, we do. Let me get rid, let me make this small here. Should I just get rid of this? This being what? Uh, do you see the little faces in the bottom corner or, or no? No, no, no. We just see your face and uh, the palms in the background. And uh, if you want, you can also um, 
uh, share the, 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 the landscape you're in there. You're in the middle of moving, right? So you have a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, um, my first slide, can you see the um, computers? We don't see the slides yet, no. So you may want to um, share screen. If maybe that didn't happen yet. OK, one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, for some reason, Zoom isn't coming up. You're broadcasting. Maybe it's hidden somewhere. Do you have to? Control? Oh, wait, wait. There we go. Now we see your whole desktop. Good, good, good. Um, but we don't want to see your whole desktop, only the slides. There we go. Perfect. Yes. Ah, you, I see what you're talking about now. The boxes are here. This is your server, I guess. All right. We're all set. OK, so um, I, I'm going to show you guys a ton of work um, because I think my uh, engagement in, in, in sort of promise in photography and working in and around photography, I, I, I hope can be really instructive. Right now um, is a sort of behind the scenes view of um, the first project. So I'm gonna do this uh, lecture a little bit out of order because I wanna show you two very new projects first. And then depending on how time goes, uh, after I show you those two projects, then I'm gonna go backwards like 10 plus years and then I'm going to rework back towards the, the near present. But instead of hoping to get to these slides, I just figured I'd put them first and then sort of flesh out a career arc from there. Oops, why is this? OK, so um, one of the things that I wanted to make it a point to share with you is uh, that these kind of lectures, um, I, I, I was thinking, I was trying to put myself in your shoes, actually. Um, and I think that there are two things from perhaps a student view that are really interesting. One is the work itself. And the second one is the sort of uh, life and ups and downs and uh, the values that a person has that are foundational to whatever they choose to do. Um, the fact that I'm a teacher. Um, so here's like a funny list of questions that I want to encourage you guys, you are free to throw these um, back at me at the end of this. Uh, and some examples are, um, how did you get that exhibition? How do you get a gallery? Um, where does your money come from? Are you happy? What is unteachable? These are some starting questions uh, Thinking about, I don't know, that the, the lessons uh, or the opportunities in a lecture like this, I think are um, to a large extent art, but there's a sort of professional practices component that I love talking about. So I really wanna encourage you guys um, to, to, to get everything you can out of me. Um, I also just sort of wanted to mention my um, website where I have a lot of other projects uh, pretty well documented and narrated. And I kind of wanted to, I added this very close to the end of my preparation for this because when I was uh, turned 40 and it, uh, soon after that, I had this moment, like, I think I want to redo a website. I think I really want to work with um, a designer and my designer threw a bunch of questions at me. Uh, and so in a weird way, doing the website was a much more existential act than I thought it would. And one of the things I've been thinking about is that as an artist, it's key for you to become your own archivist. And uh, because I feel like a lot of the projects I do follow some kind of 
consistent research inquiries, but let parlay out into much sort of different uh, objects and installations that I really take great care about the way that um, text and scholarship, whether it's my writing or expository writing or the writing of others when I'm lucky enough to get it is uh, included. Okay. And so I also told the, the designer of the website, I wanna use the website as a resource. Like I, when I prepare for a grant, I wanna be able to go on the website and grab high res images. Um, and he built that into the site. So uh, I find myself um, using this as a grant writing tool. That was just sort of a, a kind of opportunity that I glimpsed uh, because he was asking me a lot of hard questions. Um, and the last thing that he taught me about is uh, doing a phone first design, um, which seemed of course in this day and age, like, yeah, of course. Um, Cause I always think of websites and maybe, you know, I'm 44 now. So, um, and one thing you'll see in my work is that my lifetime happens to straddle a very sort of analog on one side paradigm and a very digital uh, paradigm on the other. And you'll see that throughout the work. And um, maybe it's this old school, this which makes for me a website, um, even though this might not seem that important or people have really uh, vibrant Instagram or whatever social media context that they put their work in. Um, it's been really important to me as a sort of uh, living historian of what I'm trying to do. So the first project, this thing I'm very enmeshed in right now that I wanna introduce, uh, it's called Public Public Address. It's a nationwide virtual protest. And I wanna remind you that um, this is a collaboration. So it's uh, Stephanie Sihuko, who is uh, also uh, actually as at U UC Berkeley, many of you might know her, work alongside her, have taken her classes. And the other artist is Sebrin Versteeg, who is uh, in New York, New York. Uh, and I wanna make it a point to say that uh, all the work that I'm showing you is uh, shared labor and ideation and spirit. And it's my job to try to give you my perspective. I'm, I'm, I don't wanna speak on behalf of all three of us um, but I'm trying to give you what I think is a more personal perspective on as one of these three collaborators and what I'm doing. So now I'm going to quickly show you guys something which I'm going to show you guys a two minute news story. Virtual now. Black Lives Matter Tampa will be using this platform for protesters who cannot join them out on the streets like people battling COVID-19. With the creators tell ABC Action News reporter J.J. Burton, they are going to do this 24-7 until the November election. <laughs> For months, we've seen millions out in the streets marching, chanting, and demanding racial equality. Think about all the people who, um, for a number of reasons, might not be able to protest physically on the street. A lot of people battling COVID-19. The disabled, undocumented immigrants, parents without child care, and they more, and that's about to change. Check this out. It's a huge crowd of protesters marching. The only difference, they're in their house. We're here to widen the possibility of participation and visibility. USF professor Jason Lazarus, Professor Stephanie Seguco in California, and artist Sabrin Bristig in New York spent the last couple of months creating this virtual protest platform called Public Public Address. And it's real simple. Protesters will just use their phone to record themselves marching in place. For those who are wheelchair or bed bound, you can just hold up a sign and chant and send that in. The video will then be edited and put into a system with thousands. The public will be able to uh, log in at any time, day or night, and see um, the, pro the virtual protest happen. Black Lives Matter Tampa will be the first organization to use the program when it launches in early August. Our project isn't meant to replace um, you know, uh, physical protests because in a way, you know, they, they go hand in hand and people really do need to show up. In Tampa, JJ Burton, ABC. So yeah. what's interesting about that is that, um, you know, a lot of protests get covered in these compressed uh, media short clips 
and uh, it's really weird as uh, like what what we can like as a fine artist to see a project um, uh, compressed and sort of I don't know brought to the local Tampa action news is a very sort of uh, weird and wonderful and curious moment. And so I'm gonna revisit um, a moment of this um, in, a, in a few slides. So I wanna show you guys what led to this project, which I also think is really interesting. Um, in 2017, I invited Stephanie to come down and do a lecture. And also she had about a seven or eight day stint here. And also um, we did a workshop together called the Speculative Descent Laboratory. And uh, what you're looking at are two views of um, the, the workshop, protest signs of protests, right? So already, um, I think one of the things that Stephanie and I were interested in is ideas of power, visibility, uh, and representation are all very much in flux in an active street protest. And we've both made work that alludes to or embodies or tries to investigate what are the things that a lot of artists think about that um, actually happen in protest contexts. So one of the things that we were thinking about is the protest itself has in a sense been somewhat of a slow inner innovator um, that there's been a lot of sort of um, in some ways in physical protest sort of um, not much modes of reinvention one could argue uh, when you see a kind of maybe a protest sign with a different sort of shape or visual strategy I feel like those become really attractive because um, when one says protest or street protest, I think there's this, you know, a kind of like montage clip in our head of what that might look like. And oftentimes um, what protests actually look like um, can be in some ways pretty predictable. And so we thought, um, why not do a workshop with students where we try to think about the act of making a sign uh, and documenting like how that sign might look in a hypothetical public space could be complicated. So, you know, one uh, the space between art and politics, uh, this is important, um, we think is most rich when, when each perspective asks for reimagination from the other, that um, those aren't sort of binary fields and that they have much to learn from each other. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, we're really interested in uh, following or trying to create um, in our own work or when we work with students, uh, aesthetic ruptures, prompting students or the participants to consider themselves active participants in the formation of resistance as opposed to bystanders of history. And I think that's potentially like a really common feeling we have at our worst is that history marches on oblivious to our interior life, um, our thoughts in need, or even our survival. Uh, so in the upper right is a partial view of this open lab space that we created as part of the workshop. There were uh, historic and contemporary images, uh, brainstorming <clears throat> notes. We even had some prompts for the students, sort of like stations where they might um, be asked to kind of Mm, come up, solve a visual obstacle. On the bottom left, we had a little area of um, historic kind of iconic moments of protest. And uh, once the students got to work, um, one of these uh, challenges was to create protest signage that literally acts as surveillance equipment. Um, one of the things that as a workshop, we all got interested in uh, was the idea of protest signs that have, um, that are either eyeballs or a set of eyes or sort of embody the sense of, you know, we are watching you or history is watching you, you will be held to account. And the students uh, started to play with this and they actually started to embed their 
phones into the back of protest signs so that they could be uh, filming and, you know, literally filming through the pupils of the graphic representations of eyeballs on the signs that they were creating. Uh, we also had sort of a, a photo station with a green screen uh, backdrop. And so, you know, if students ended up creating either signs or sort of protest objects or ideas that we could immediately document them. Um, we also had a, a slew of uh, green screen, screen signs that, of course, um, are then allow um, heavy sort of projection of images later onto those screens. And then this is a moment where uh, the signs, you know, start to actually become figures. You see feet sticking out. Um, and we have uh, one, one of the other things we wanted to play with was this idea of um, either historic or recent protest images being um, blown up and becoming protest signs themselves. Uh, we also really leaned into this tactic of um, what you guys can do is take low res images from the internet. You can run a color halftone filter on them on Photoshop and then do what's called tiling. And then, um, you know, because we're hosted by the school, we had access to a color sort of fast and dirty laser printer. And so we together as a workshop picked out an image and, you know, that wasn't very large to begin with. And we ran it through this digital workflow and then we uh, tiled, this is soon after Trump got elected, um, an image of a limo burning. We the people spray painted on it, anarchy sign, uh, another, um, uh, and we um, taped it together and then used um, my station wagon as a sort of support picket behind it kind of creating a little bit of a stationary billboard that from a particular angle could create sort of like a moment of a little bit of slippage. And so, um, you know, thinking about all protests as also objects, this wonderful, which a lot of you guys might be interested, this relationship between 3D objects and 2D images. And a lot of artists spend their whole lives um, in this sort of wonderful circuit of what it is to like drag things back through that circuit over and over again. Uh, here's a group shot of workshop participants. Um, so this is, uh, Stephanie had been asked to do an exhibition. It's um, opening this month at the Blaffer Art Museum at the University of Houston. And they asked her to do a, a sort of engagement project with her students or with students at the University of Houston. So she asked me if I might want to um, do our speculative dissent workshop together um, down in Houston. And so pre-COVID, we were in the midst of negotiating our calendars and, uh, you know, really about to sort of um, commit to doing a physical workshop, COVID hit, things got complicated really quick. And so after, um, when we had time to check in with each other, we basically are like, well, there's a kind of uh, complicated sort of growing up process that every public place and institution is coming up with, which is like, are they really gonna go, um, offline or, or to what degree or when are they going to do it? So we're like, you know what, let's just flip the whole idea as like a digital project. And, and so we, we, we thought to ourselves, how can we make a potentially a project that could not be canceled? And um, so when we were talking about digital artwork or what it would be to like have students work with digital files or submit them into something bigger, um, I thought of an artist that I knew from Chicago from years before and that I was still um, friendly with named Sebrin Versteeg. Um, here's a work of Sebrin's called Today's Paper with Flies from last year. This work depicts a self-portrait image of the artist seated in front of their New York City studio reading a newspaper. The paper's image within is updated with the latest edition daily continuously reflecting the passing of time in the news of the moment. Over the course of a 24 hour cycle, algorithmically animated flies appear within the tableau with increased frequency. 
So this uh, front page of the Miami Herald is the main kinetic element, right? That's constantly being updated. Um, and that screen is actually quite big. I think it's like six or seven feet tall and it's sort of leaned in the corner of this exhibition. Uh, okay, so going back to that two minute news clip, they had this swipe that when I was scrubbing through the video, I was really interested in, which is this sort of long view into a protest. I imagine this is sort of a reportage, maybe with a little bit of a longer lens. And um, they did this wipe and I was like, interesting because on the right is our project before we went public, but we had the algorithm kind of going. And uh, I thought this was really kind of instructive to me about sort of when we're trying to create a digital space where there are no rules, it's like, well, what is the sort of gravity or linearity, right? But also these ideas of um, how we can break gravity and linearity um, alongside, you know, notions of people having to stay inside and time and space, et cetera, that we were interested in. So one moment in this project that I think was really interesting, um, and again, I'd like to point out this project is living. So um, it's a very exciting and wild and worrisome process in that we're trying to work with the public and there are lots of uh, constituents and stakeholders. And so I thought I would invite you into some moments of where the project contours were sort of set and, and then we kind of like threw wrenches into what we were doing and, and, and made a few uh, value changes to the project. Mm -hmm. A big one, which was this idea of when we first started the project, um, we were really only focused on inviting those people unable to protest on the street. So highlighted below is our list of, you know, and not a complete list, but um, the people we were thinking about as a starting to this list of those who are immunocompromised, people with disabilities, precarious community members, including undocumented individuals, or those at risk of deportation, medical workers, caregivers, uh, those without childcare, those are housebound, bedbound, uh, and of course, the many other reasons one may need to protest virtually. Um, we are actively prioritizing black and brown participants and seek to center them in the work. Um, so what we learned in talking to participants and also to some activists who we consulted with on developing this project is the idea that people who couldn't protest on the street for whatever reason were not interested as much in being singled out as much as being in a newly democratized space that had wider accessibility. Uh, so in that case, we now reiterate the idea that this project is for folks who are both um, unable to protest and physically able to protest. I occupy a sort of weird moment in between those two because I was born with a physical condition called arthrogryposis. And in many ways, I'm um, very lucky and have um, uh, a somewhat abled body. And, uh, but I live with chronic pain and uh, arthritis uh, that can be very debilitating. And so, for example, this is a protest sign that I actually used in a protest in Tampa after COVID started, but when Tampa's social justice community came alive. And um, of course, when I'm making this sign at home, I was super excited. I used a broom. I really wanted it to be big and legible and you know, contrasting colors. And then once I was in like 95 degree heat with humidity, I could barely, you know, hold this sign up for more than five minutes. I was just actually trying to focus on um, keeping distance from people and keeping up with the pace of the protesters. So, you know, um, I, I think my personal experience is, it's a bit interesting because I feel like I'm in um, inside the gradient of people that we're referring to. And, you know, in the future might find myself um, less able to protest on the streets. 
So once we got this project up and running, we started to get submissions and the submissions, the, the, one of my favorite things about public projects or projects that ask for participation uh, is that the project starts to get complex on its own. It's in a sense more creative than what sometimes I feel like I could ever hope to be in the signifiers and the bodies and the perspectives. Um, like that I end up becoming a student of the project. Um, this participant uh, had to remain, remain anonymous, green screened their cardboard and then animated their own sign. Um, and so when I saw the submission, I was just thrilled because they took the technology and folded a couple steps um, forward. And so it's such a beautiful thing to see um, this animated sign in the protest. It's, it's, it's um, so another, again, moment where the project becomes complicated. Uh, holding a child in one hand and a sign in the other, thinking about caretakers versus those who uh, need to be cared for. Uh, more people of color should own guns. This protester actually has a gun in their waistband. Um, so the project complicates itself intensely uh, with every submission. Uh, and you see a variety of bodies, of contexts, of messages, of formal strategies. Um, if you can breathe, help those who can't. This participant is the daughter of the previous submission. Ya basta, enough. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Black Lives Matter. This is the Black Lives Matter Tampa chapter. Donna Davis is on the right. She's the lead organizer on the left is Tati Orengo, who is also a Black Lives Matter uh, Tampa organizer and co-founder of Si Se um, Okay. Okay, so after we got the project going, there was this moment where in a street protest, um, oftentimes there's this moment where people are maybe marching uh, and they uh, end up at an intersection or a plaza. And then perhaps there's a series of speakers who are really speaking to the moment of the protest. And we thought, how could we replicate or do an analog of that? And so um, we realized that we could do somewhat of a megaphone moment, um, which is to perhaps ask or invite people to zoom into the protest feed um, and that the project could also be a broadcast platform um, where we can invite uh, activists or activist organizations to do long form conversations rather than what they're always faced with is um, media compression, sound bites, and then whatever information gets put into like a mainstream media um, format oftentimes becomes so complicated uh, and edited and um, you know can run away from the, the actual words and motivations of the activists themselves. Uh, and the second thing is that these conversations be could become an archive of this moment. So perhaps whether it's in a month or 10 years that if we archive these long conversations, if someone wants to hear what a protester or an organization had to say in a more long form, that this could you know, hopefully be just another primary or secondary research um, repository. And so when we talked to Black Lives Matter Tampa, we invited them to help launch our project. And we had sort of four moments of our hour long conversation. One was to speak to this exact political moment. The second was to talk about what the range of initiatives and activities that they were doing that so many of them are not protests that are very much um, social safety net and a lot of school prep uh, for students and materials and supplies. Um, I asked for them to talk about their fundraising and to tell people how they could donate to this particular chapter. And then the night before we were talking about what we could talk about. And um, this really interesting idea came up, which is um, this idea that I asked Donna 
um, what is a question that you would like to be asked? And she responded, I wish people would ask me more what else I wish I was, I could be doing. And I thought that was a terribly insightful and unexpected moment. So with her permission, we ended the interview with both Tati and Donna with that question. And um, what was so powerful to me was talk, it kind of put their work in such a new relief to me. Uh, it brings up ideas of um, the opportunity, like to use an annoying business term, like the opportunity cost, like for people who commit their lives for social justice, um, essentially having such a remedial conversation to the masses, which is to ask um, for a stop to violence, a stop for racism, for equality, that this is, this, this forsakes other, other, other lives, other, other long arcs of human experience and wondering. And if you've ever had moments in your life where you felt privileged enough to do things or to experience things where you, in a sense, weren't pushed up against the wall, but you were allowed to have slow, wonderful, fumbling moments of human growth and experience. These are the things that activists, um, in you know, activists with a capital A, who dedicate their lives to us. You know, there's a whole range of um, uh, experiences that that they forsake, and 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 that was how our conversation ended. Um, here's a glimpse of what it looks like when we zoom into the feed. Um, so the Zoom feed is, you know, hovering over the whole time. All these protesters keep streaming down. Um, I very much invite you, if you're interested in participating in the project, um, this is one of our most recent submissions from someone actually uh, outside London. Um, so on the left are sort of our most basic, like how, how the public can submit to this project. One is that if you can't protest or you can and you want to submit, you could submit for yourself or another way to participate in the project. If there's someone else who has wanted to protest in the streets and can't, that you could act as a surrogate and spend um, your, your you know, time or energy in helping to someone else participate because, you know, what it is to film yourself uh, when you're already potentially limited can be a little bit of a complicated act. And we ask the public um, when they're submitting to fill the frame, do a vertical hold um, to as much as possible, have legible text, keep the camera still. And um, we select them off the background, often using color. And um, the selections in the project, which you'll see a little bit, um, are not perfect. But in a way, these digital artifacts that come along with imperfect selections of the bodies you know, there might be like um, a doorknob or an electrical outlet following the protesters um, through the streets. To me has been this wonderful aesthetic rupture, which is these individual homebound um, experiences really come to life. So here's what our website looks like. Very simple, the protest stream is happening 24 seven, unless we're doing some kind of technical, um, you know, reboot or uh, maintenance. We have a participate um, instructional link, a Facebook link, and then we have uh, the Black Lives Matter Tampa Facebook page linked and the broadcast recording archived. Another opportunity of this project is um, that we can do uh, workshops with any kind of social justice uh, or you know, allied intersectional organizations. So um, I had the opportunity to do a Zoom workshop with uh, a Chicago-based organization called the Arts of Life, which serves artists with developmental disabilities. This just happened. Freedom is about who we are, not what we are. Black Lives Matter, Area Carter. Oh. 
making a clean sweep, sweep forward, submission by H.J. Broom, who imagines a lot of his uh, current artistic work as um, masks. So I think these uh, protest signs that H.J. submitted, he submitted four or five. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to think that um, it's sort of conceptually H.J. is thinking of these uh, as a kind of template as masks. So the ongoing sort of questions and concerns of this project, which I'm happy to talk about at the end of the presentation, um, is uh, what is success? Because the project is living, there is a kind of constant sort of, you know, we have to have a willingness to, uh, or, or try to take very, seriously, the idea of um, listening to the constituents in the project and asking them what they want or, or, or what is a kind of broadcast possibility for them. Uh, that this project is a gradient between being what it initially started as a kind of more speculative space uh, and, you know, now with the speaking platform or these archive conversations, there's sort of a ongoing relationship between specu speculative uh, space and utility or, you know, a more functioning sort of archive. Uh, and then skipping down, you know, questions of like, well, when we have success for the project, what is the relationship of the success um, for justice, right? And that those two things can be convergent and divergent. Um, what I've learned from Donna, who I've had the pleasure of speaking to a lot, or what she says um, in regards to Black Lives Matter Tampa is that they, uh, they move at the speed of trust. That's how she talks about the work that she does uh, with Black Lives Matter Tampa, which I always remember and kind of think about, you know, as we reach out to people, um, I think about that value uh, when publicly engaged. And um, last, how do we reach beyond our bubble? So Stephanie and Sebrin and I all have our bubbles and, um, you know, the reaching people who, uh, you know, that in an algorithmic age, this is something we have to actively think about. Okay, the second pretty recent project I wanna share um, is I was uh, asked to be in an exhibition about metadata. Metadata is something that I have never studied. I've kind of taught sort of software metadata uh, concerns for students who are shooting in raw. And, you know, I probably read some articles about metadata. And uh, I was really interested in this prompt for an exhibition. It's actually going to happen in about a year, year and a half. Um, it was it was delayed at the Ringling Museum of Art uh, in Sarasota, Florida, which is actually a pretty phenomenal museum. Uh, I saw a recent sort of installation of Coco Fusco's there uh, last year. Um, so in a way, one of the things that I like as an artist is actually not being studied in particular subjects and stumbling into them, or maybe even misunderstanding concepts. Um, so. I think uh, around the same time I had this exhibition prompt in my head, I'm, it's sort of like a puzzle that you're potentially thinking about day in, day out as you go about really mundane activities. And um, one of the things that I started staring at was the um, webcam cover tape that I had on my laptop and the tape was old and uh, it was, you know, in all honesty, like it was stained and kind of gross, but it also had this kind of errant um, fold or so on the upper right hand corner. And I started to look at it as a sculpture. And uh, then I started to daydream about, you know, if I wanted to reference this actual webcam, what what could I do? And I, I started to daydream about, you know, what if this, if I sort of sculpturally made sort of like a seven foot long version, trying to res up this tiny little physical object. Um, and then in preparing for this lection, uh, 
or pre I'm sorry, preparing for this presentation, uh, I also wanted to ask or ask in front of you guys that there were questions I was wondering, which is what is this piece of tape an asterisk of, or what is the asker asterisk of the tape? I think an asterisk is the sort of conceptual tactic I think about all the time, which is, is it the sort of main word or main sentence or main concern, or is it a sort of disclaimer or another sort of, uh, I don't know, teleology or lineage or disclaimer? Um, and so I thought to myself, before I overthink it, I'm going to start just collecting other people's webcam covers. And so here's a really early kind of phone photo of what that started to look like. And, you know, this is pre COVID and I was always going in and out of classes and seeing them on my students computers or traveling and in airports. And so I would kind of have this uh, little bit of a lurking strategy all of the time when anyone had their laptop open in public, I would always try to walk behind them so that I could see if they had a webcam cover. <laughs> and then, um, you know, this continued. And one of the things that I realized that I do in my projects um, is that because, you know, I went, to, I got my MFA for, or for photography uh, at Columbia College Chicago in 2003. And it was a you know, it was a wonderful program and it was very documentary rooted. Um, it, I would consider it more of a straight program, which I realized because later I was asked to teach uh, adjunct at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago down the street. And then, you know, honestly, like teaching there was almost like going to grad school again. And it really opened up um, other sort of methodologies and inquiries. So, you know, when people ask me what I do, um, I kind of, I think of myself as an artist or um, a artist, you know, what, what Gregory um, said at the beginning, and I encourage you guys to do this, is to try to summarize your work in as few words possible, not as a way to limit yourself, but to try to get at the essence of what it is that you do. And um, as a teacher, and I'm always trying to do this with students, so I, I have this other sort of teaching calisthenics where I'm thinking about this stuff for other people, which then I kind of ends up folding back to me and vice versa. The more I have to think about it for myself, I'm a better teacher working with students. Uh, it's kind of this continually folding forward. So I also like to think of these as, you know, part of like what I would consider or what might be called an expanded photographic practice. And that I like to think of these webcam covers and Gregory was already, you know, picking up on this um, in our conversations, getting ready for this as, you know, the webcam covers become surrogates um, for lens cap, right? So if you take a camera on a tripod and you are an artist working in expanded field, you could ask yourself, what is the tripod? What is the viewfinder? What is the lens cap? Um, anything sort of physical or material to the act of photo making is also sort of a metaphor, um, as well as being, of course, a, a metaphor for, you know, an eyelid or some kind of gate or uh, a firewall or um, what I like to say is that I also like to think of them as the world's smallest protest signs. And so when I um, started to make so one of the things um, I've worked with animated gifts before I made with a collaborator, a 90 minute film comprised of uh, entirely animated gifts, which uh, I won't be talking about today, but is linked on my website. Um, that I love the idea when I was working with animated gifts is gifts as archives. Um, and so this animated gif I think is when I was around a hundred in my collection and so I really didn't want to blast this project till I could have a number that started to feel a little bit more than just a whimsy that, that like an animation uh, via a GIF might kind of start to look a little bit more like, oh, it seems like this person's really taking this goofy idea um, seriously and to start to kind of complicate the idea of what these things um, look like and then here's um you know when i do high res scans they're they're actually you know very beautiful um you know threadbare on the edges 
um, small bodies. And uh, I was asked by um, a colleague who's teaching um, at Pratt, um, Pratt has like an Ithaca uh, campus and she's organizing something called study hall uh, where the students can, uh, um, they're, they're, they're not socially distanced or they're, they're, they're social distance. They're, they're working a lot on campus and they're doing it social distance. So anyways, um, she said, would you want to be in an exhibition that we basically mount in the student sort of, uh, work area and we're actually going to make a catalog. Um, she asked me to do, um, to, if I wanted to submit something and I was like, well, what work are you most interested in? And she said the webcam project, which I had never really done anything with except sort of blast out that I was collecting these. So what you're looking at right now is a 40 by 50 inch print, which was me sort of taking the uh, dozens and dozens of uh, examples I have in my archive and playing with them as sort of like a, I, I hadn't really thought about it. I thought I would always take the actual um, webcam covers and actually make like a very spaced out grid on a big exhibition wall and maybe have other works that were hanging there. Certainly that could be done, but I'm really into this as this um, one sort of way that this archive can become um, a print. And so I'm still collecting actively and um, I'd really like to do maybe more of a 50 by 70 inch version. Uh, so bigger than this and also a bit more dense. Um, so that, those are some like steps I'm thinking about in the future. Here's uh, a zoom in uh, to get a little bit of a better look. The ranges of submissions are um, wild. I make it a point to ask people that I don't want just cute ones, like they need not be flashy. Um, that like I embrace all of the submissions and I think a lot of there's a lot of uh, blue artist tape and so that becomes a little bit of a you know a motif or a rhythm in the project so the way that I work with blue in this project is um, I have to be very thoughtful because it's almost like besides the background it's sort of like um, uh, you know the white point of the project. Uh, what really helped this project get off the ground a bit was um, uh, a, somebody at uh, Vice picked up on the project um, and I think was compelled by calling it um, uh, or referring to my idea that it was the world's smallest protest sign. And, you know, we were kind of thinking or playing around that, you know, um, who knows who else is collecting them. Perhaps it's the photos of the first known collection of webcam covers. They, had, they actually did a really long interview. I was really impressed. Um, and they asked me what compels you to collect. And then here's my response. I think it's a form of love, a belief that these everyday materials radiate greater possibilities of bearing witness and present future meanings that generates the compulsion to collect. Collecting is also a necessary counterpoint to my other forms of making, which initially was to always pick up a camera, control it, and execute an image. After making many images from 2003 to 2008, I wanted to say less and listen more to introduce more chance and discovery in my practice and in the way I navigate the world. Here's um, when I was uh, in Chile last summer doing some work about the solar eclipse. Um, I was also actively uh, collecting these. They were sitting in my wallet. Um, and uh, so I was, I was trying to like document little groups of them uh, as I went or when I had the opportunity to like flyer someplace in an art context, here's an example um, of, you know, just fun ways to kind of keep the sort of submission project um, alive in my head. Um, I do, when people send me a submission, I send them back this very dorky little thank you sticker, which is um, in doing research on this project, um, you know, there's this one image of Mark Zuckerberg um, where someone spied uh, a webcam cover on the laptop that Mark was using. And so in the lower left, you can see the circle um, that shows someone, you know, online was uh, spied it. And then uh, there was a lot of uh, tweeting and social media commenting on the fact like, well, if Mark Zuckerberg does it or why does he do it or is this necessary? 
And so I actually kind of went in on the highest res image that I could find. And um, I have a picture of his webcam cover tape made as a sticker that then you can use. That's my little thank you. I The, the example I have up on the right is one that I, I cut them out by hand. And so it's a little bit wonky. It was one of the first ones that I cut out. Um, some more detail shots of this. I have no idea what those numbers are. The fact that it's eight numbers to me is very compelling. Three, five, eight, five, nine, nine, one, two, five. Or wait, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, yeah, who knows what that could be, whether a social security phone number, you know, like where does the mind jump to? This PA in the middle was from a participant who uh, was from the United Arab Emirates and was very paranoid about um, being spied on um, coming from that political context. And so there's a lot of hidden stories uh, in this um, collection. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna work backwards and I see that I'm at, um, where are we at here? Um, we're, we're at, uh, Jason, thank you so much. We're at uh, uh, question time actually. And uh, I wanted to ask you if, if um, you wanted to share more work or if you would be ready to take some questions because people will leave at one. Uh, yeah, what I can do is um, I can fast forward to um, those photographs. Sorry, this is maybe a little bit dizzying. You have a lot to share there. And, and I was thinking I'd love to have a, a webcam cover wallpaper. You know, it's such a beautiful pattern that you generate as well. And the colors are so lovely. I would love to just have a whole wall done. Oh, that. okay, yeah, that's a great thing to know. So I'll, I'll just share this, my last thought. Yep. Um, after Trump got elected, I started after um, reading about, and especially the best coverage I found of it was in Teen Vogue, was when um, the White House, um, the first day of the Trump administration, that the White House phone number was disconnected. And after a few days, people started to tweet and cover it. And, uh, you know, the phone number to the White House is such a funny, weird gate, right? It's another sort of gate of entry. And, you know, I think many of us are not, um, you know, calling up the White House with much of a realistic expectation of what would happen. But it was sort of like in the very, beginning minutes and hours of the administration, this very kind of curious thing, I started to get really interested in it. And at the same time, I was teaching a class uh, on black and white photography, but trying to get the students to think about the black and white dark room as a place where they were to uh, be very exper experimental and to bring in a lot of kind of contemporary issues and um, also, you know, to be working in a lot of digital collage uh, and then perhaps, uh, or doing performative actions in the dark room. So as always, like, because I was more thinking about the dark room, I started to make these, um, what are actually called chemograms, um, where I'm painting with a developer stop in fix bath. Um, and, uh, I wanted to really invoke the spirit of making a protest sign. I do these really fast in the dark room in big batches. And um, I really embrace um, messiness. You know, the chemicals start to leak into each other, working quickly. Um, and I kind of think of the, the writing of the phone number is kind of, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit of a performance in the dark room. Um, and I'm also oftentimes lighting or exposing these with my phone um, or flashlights or walking out with them. Um, oftentimes I'll do chemicals in the wrong order. I'll expose them at the wrong time. Um, and to Greg, to answer your question, I really believe um, that the seriality of these, the kind of oscillating legibility, you know, I, I, I learned pretty quickly how to make black numbers on a white background. And so I feel like the more aesthetic sort of experimentation and variation that the more I felt myself sort of, um, I don't know, in an embodied way sort of thinking about uh, the White House phone number or the sort of uh, as a surrogate for all sorts of forms 
of resistance and also for the people that those resistance, um, you know, resistance of all the bodies and perspectives and contexts that those people come from. Beautiful, thank you. I, I especially like the white numbers on the black background. How did you do those? That seems like a little more tricky because I can see the, you know, the, the reverse, but uh, there's- Right, it's like, it's like masking. It's basically like masking. Do I start with a mask or do I mask later? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very rich, very gestural. Well, thank you so much. Let's uh, switch to questions quickly and uh, lots of applause again. Thank you for speaking to us so generously, sharing all your work. Um, uh, from the three bodies of work we saw, there's of course many more and you made an early point about archive. And I have to admit, I admire your archive so much. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of the work itself is to store it up and uh, make it accessible and to, and new media is so fragile. So, so you have to contend with that as well. And the websites have to be rebuilt all the time. So do you have like a master archive of pictures that you can draw from or uh, offsite storage? What's, the, what's your secret for making it work? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I honestly, the real secret, cause like, I'm not always the most organized person. And I think Same here, and, and I went to, um, uh, I went to business school as an undergrad at DePaul university. And then, uh, I worked two years in, um, nonprofit marketing. I was doing marketing for sort of a conceptual theater at the University of Chicago. And I think that's the first time I started to think about other modes of being. Uh, I wanted to do work with what I thought was like a culturally redeeming institution. And uh, I started to take photo classes at night on a whim. Um, so what I learned quickly is that the more you care about what you're doing, the more all your uh, weak points become contendable with, you know, like the more I care about things, the more I'm manic and excited. And, and um, you know, I do a mixture like many of you guys, I'm sure of cloud, hard drive, um, you know, making my website be a lot of like what I consider the work I wanna put most forward. And then um, having a lot of work, you know, I don't know, I guess existing and, you know, anything from like anal analog to digital, uh, you know, tentacles. Um, and it's a little bit overwhelming because the more projects that you have that are ongoing, it can be, you can get to feel a little frozen, like at my worst, um, I can get a little bit overwhelmed and you have to decide uh, and ask yourself like, what project is the most revelatory for you and or maybe speaks to the moment? You know, um, I have a hard time ending projects uh, and um, you know, but I re honestly, the biggest learning curve or one thing I thought, or I really learned in grad school is this idea of when are you sort of simply like, when are you learning when, when you, when you stop learning about your subject and you feel like you're unpacking things from it is the time to move on. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise it becomes a little bit of a, a kind of, um, you know, it becomes a little bit of a fetish or you're sort of, you know, pretend it, depending on the project, you're maybe just sort of making objects for the sake of making objects. Yeah. Well, thank you. Let's switch it over to Edgar and Hala, who's going to, who are going to ask you more questions from the Q and A in which there are a number of interesting questions. And uh, thanks for switching over the video. And uh, so your slides are no longer sharing. So we're just talking now. Um, Edgar and Hala, do you want to go ahead? Edgar looks like you're first. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to go first. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture. Um, I wanted to ask you first a question from one of our students. Her name um, is Atmika uh, Pai, and she wanted to know about the hashtag first day, first image project um, and what inspired you to start that. Oh, okay, that's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so... Um, gosh, two or three years ago, um, my colleague saw Wendy Babcox at the University of South Florida, who is like my, we're of two faculty photo department here at USF. And uh, Wendy went and saw the Carrie James Marshall exhibition a few years ago in New York. And she was, as many people were, 
many moved and floored and thrilled and also newly informed about sort of Carrie James Marshall's words about sort of painting yourself into the canon, right? Or so, sort of like these value systems that sort of have continually driven his practice um, already for decades. And so she said to me, I will never not start a class without thinking again about Carrie James' work and this idea of, you know, the creating of the canon. And so she's like, I'm gonna always start showing African-American artists as the first thing I show. And after thinking about it um, and dialoguing with her and then starting to dialogue with other artists who, you know, are like older or younger than me. I think once you go into academia there's the, like it's a wonderful to have a network always with artists like who is your community and you find yourself like flummoxed or backed in a corner are you needing support or you're needing to be challenged in some way anyways so this idea i started you know uh thinking about um right that the first image that you show in a class given wendy's sort of recent epiphany and sort of personal commitment that she had no like had no thoughts about broadcasting it or performing it, you know? And I was like, what if, uh, you know, I was like, I think I want to do that. And I'm teaching, building curriculums is such a sort of powerful and potentially violent act, right? And so um, of course, a lot of the, so first day, first image came out of that where we sort of ask artist educators, you know, who are in that context, or if you want um, to consider um, broadcasting the first image you show on the first day of class and um, first day, first image asks for people who uh, are typically underrepresented. So we sort of broaden the umbrella uh, and uh, with the hashtag now, when you go to Instagram, because um, you can follow a hashtag, right? If you want, which is also really great for research, right? Um, but you can see uh, a couple hundred posts, I think, of classes where the teacher has done this. So it's also a little bit of an archive uh, mm -hmm. itself. Um, and it's been this great ritual for me because I, you know, when we do these artworks, like I also need to have, ha hold myself to account um, and the project becomes a way where it's, um, you know, being like, okay, we're gonna start at zero again. You're in this sort of beautiful ritual of teaching and recycling and, and you know, um, asking yourself to dig in and then, you know, following other people along as they do that. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, we have a question from our audience, uh, Aaron Chiang. Um, Aaron, if you're still here and you would love to, uh, to ask a question. Amazing. Aaron is with us. I just unmuted him. Perfect. Um, first off, thank you so much for speaking today. And my question is, how do you think digital art like GIFs has altered interaction uh, with the artwork and how like your viewers interact. And then the second part is, do you receive different reactions to your digital art versus your live art? Um, okay, the first question, sort of the impact of digital. Uh, if, if I understand correctly, I mean, I think I'll, I'll just sort of revisit something that I just kind of sped through in the lecture, which is um, I was born in 1975. So as opposed to being an analog or a digital person, we're in this unique moment, all of us, right? Where we are, um, um, that, that kind of, uh, those paradigms, which become sort of uh, beautiful and violent gradients, right? Like issues of framing, um, which I've always been interested in and come up again and again in my work. Like to me, it's sort of, I don't really think of it as digital or analog, it's sort of like oftentimes thinking about one through the other um, and that they happen to 
you know, and a lot of times implicate each other and anything that we make physical is already, you know, potentially going online with much great ease these days, right? And so I think the, these ideas, um, I, I would sort of argue against, I think it's a more, the better question are sort of the values and ideas that you then, you know, become sort of uh, problematized or mined or contoured through both analog and digital systems, right? Um, what, one project that um, is a big part of my work or how Stephanie and I got to know each other initially was that after, um, during Occupy Wall Street, like a lot of people, I was looking through all the slideshows of the cardboard signs and the collector instinct in me wanted to go to protest and participate and to collect the signs but you don't want to collect signs and then just scurry them away for your own art practice or, you know, you're sort of like always, what are the ethics of this? Um, you know, who else will be doing this? And so what I ended up doing was um, doing this on my own and then inviting um, a student who like wanted to work with me or wanted to like help in the studio. I was like, okay, let's try recreating these protest signs. We'll project these images, these, you know, either real reportage images or citizen journalist images or whoever, right? We'll take these images, we'll project them on the studio wall, we'll have some cardboard around and we'll try to study them and try to remake them. We'll look at the body, like to scale them, we'll mimic the creases and the tears. And it was like, cause like, let's, now we can just not have to collect the actual ones. We can travel through time and space, right? So we could get ones that were like, in Lebanon, for example, like from San Francisco to Lebanon. And then we can, you know, by each one that we pick and we started inviting other people in to do it is that then it became really interesting. Well, which sign do you want to re-physicalize, right? So there's this sort of solidarity and, and, and kind of like a recommitment or a new sort of activation or levitation of the sign itself. Um, so that's a project that then grew into, you, you know, a pretty big archive where I've gotten to install it at the MCA Chicago and the Contemporary Jewish Museum. Um, and basically create something that like, I wanted to stand in front of, a, and I wanted to take my nephew to stand in front of, who was like, as a baby could maybe like only see this stuff, right? Like what would it be like to stand in a museum wing and be in a fishbowl of physical signs that everyone who collaborated in the project chose to sort of reanimate that sign. So in a sense, it becomes about the political issues, not the analog digital, you know, and those, those are kind of wonderful, you know, it's great to have problematized uh, or like all sorts of uh, conceptual and physical grit or resistance in your work. And you ask yourself, how do I get around this? I, th I think that is a great note to end on this, this fundamental ethical question of realizing that the politics of the image um, uh, override the, the technical, technicalities of the image. Um, and your work certainly is a testimony to that. And thank you for unpacking these aspects and illuminating us so much with your, with your um, thoughts and uh, with your work. It's very inspiring. And uh, we were, we're going to send you uh, some pictures that we hope you can put into the project. Um, so we're working on that this week and the week from now. Um, you should have a whole batch of them, yeah? And uh, we can't wait to interact with that, uh, with you about that some more. Um, I'm going to switch back to my slides quickly and uh, just mention that um, after this uh, lecture by Jason, which was fabulous, we we're going to uh, continue discussion with uh, about visual cultures with uh, a voice from Mexico City, which is the um, uh, voice of Amor Munoz and uh, uh, it's called Bits and Threads, and uh, she is interested in particular in building a bridge between Mexican indigenous crafts and digital media. So Amor Munoz, October 8th at noon. We'll see you there again. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, thank you, Jason, for a fabulous and generous lecture. Paula for, and Edgar for managing the questions and keeping track of the chat. And Paris, thank you so much for organizing everything. It's always great to do this together. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.